developing skill as a meditator is very similar to developing skill as a musician. You start out with the scales. Say you're learning the piano, and you want to play beautiful music, but they have you playing these dumb scales. And it can be pretty boring. But if you don't stick with the scales, you can't play music. And over time, as you develop your ear, you begin to realize there really is a skill to running your fingers up those notes. One of the signs of a really good pianist is his ability to make his runs sound like water, totally, totally effortless. And yet a lot of effort goes into getting there. And it's the same with the meditation. Meditation is work, and there's a lot of grunt work in just getting the mind to settle down and stay still. And it's important that you not get bored by it. You sit here with the breath, and it seems like it's the hardest place to stay sometimes. The mind is off someplace else, and you've got to pull it back. It stays for a breath or two, and then it's off someplace else again. You've got to pull it back, and it's the pulling back that's an important part of the meditation. That's mindfulness, alertness. In action. That's directed thought and evaluation in action. Directed thought means just keeping your mind, keeping your thoughts with the breath. And the process of strengthening those qualities in the mind, that's when you develop the foundation for a good concentration practice. So there are two ways of meditating. One is just sitting here hoping that you'll hit the lottery, because there are times when things just come together on their own. But that can get frustrating, just hoping, what's tonight's meditation lottery going to be like? You're going to come in first, you're going to come in last. There's no skill there at all. So the other way of approaching it is to realize there's work to be done, and it may not be fun. But keep reminding yourself, this is how good meditation is built. This is how you develop an understanding of the mind, that process of how the mind slips off. It's really amazing. The mind can create all kinds of thought worlds for itself. How does it do that? As we were saying today, how does it conduct that discussion of where it's going to go, how it's going to get there? And then how does it cover all that up so you don't notice it? And it all seems to happen just on its own. If you can see into that, you learn an awful lot about the mind. You learn about ignorance, for one thing, which is the big cause of suffering. You learn about craving. What does the mind crave as it's creating these worlds? It's craving pleasure. It can be sensual pleasure, the idea of thoughts of beautiful things, thoughts of nice sounding things, and so on down the line. And there's a sense of identity that comes in with this. When you're in a world, you're functioning in a world, you're fighting off annihilation, your fear that if there's no thoughts in the mind, the mind's just going to disappear. Your awareness is going to disappear. As long as you're thinking and knowing the results of your thoughts, you know you're, you exist. And there's the potential for happiness there. We learn at a very early age that by have, developing a sense of self, we can use it to provide for pleasure in one way or another. If we were deprived of that sense of self, and this is why so many of us resist the idea of letting go of that sense of self, we'd feel that we'd be deprived of our potential for pleasure, or of the the sense of self that's experiencing the pleasure. So just in this process of the mind creating thought worlds, you see a lot about ignorance and craving and all the other factors of dependent core arising. 
It's all happening right here. But instead of having to memorize the lists of dependent co-arising, the best way to learn about these things is just to get your hands dirty, deal with the causal chains that go on in the mind, and learn how to cut them. And you'll find you're cutting them in different spots, depending on how quickly you notice what's going on. This way you learn about the mind, you learn about the processes in the mind, in the same way that you learn about eggs by cooking with them, or you learn about a piano by sitting down and playing it. Seeing what you can get out of it, what kind of sounds, what kind of satisfaction. So it's important that as you sit down to meditate, you realize you're not here just for stress, re stress relaxation, stress reduction, or for chilling out. There's work to be done. This is your concentration work, as a John Lee called it, the directed thought and the evaluation. It's keeping your mind with the breath and learning to watch it, to see what ways of breathing help keep you there with the breath, alert and mindful. Which ways of breathing make you restless? You learn this through the evaluation, i.e. evaluating times when the mind gets restless and wanders off. You go back and say, okay, I've got to try something else. You've got to be willing to learn, and it can be frustrating, and any learning experience involves some pain, some effort frustration. And it's your ability to deal emotionally with the frustration that's going to see you through. So you have to learn how to give yourself pep talks. You have to keep yourself up for the practice. This is why there are times when it's useful to reflect on the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. What kind of person was the Buddha who found this path of practice? Everything indicates that he was an extremely truthful person, very realistic, always willing to learn. And he taught purely out of compassion. I mean, after his awakening, he didn't need anything from anybody. If there wasn't enough food to keep his body going, he'd be perfectly happy to die. Because he'd already, already found a deathless happiness. So the fact that he kept the body going, kept having to deal with people 45 years. Total act of compassion. In the Dharma he taught, as they say, it was totally heartwood. In other words, there's not a lot of rhetoric. It was what, not a lot of unnecessary teachings. He focused on the big issue in life: is why is there suffering? Why do people create suffering for themselves when they want happiness? What the, can they do to learn to put an end to that suffering? And he focused on that issue in a way that still very relevant thousands of years later. And as for the Sangha, he instituted an order where people live totally on gifts. The Buddha's teaching was a gift. And the way the, the Sangha is arranged, the monks live on gifts. They don't sell the teaching. They don't have to raise kids, meet mortgage payments, all the other things that would crimp their style and really being true to the Dharma. And you look at the stories in the Theragata and the Therigata, the monks and the nuns struggling with their meditation. And you look at them and some of them were in a lot worse place than you are right now. And yet they were able to gain awakening. So that gives you encouragement that it can be done. It's not just amazing people like the Buddha who can do it. All kinds of people can do it. So 
So when you reflect on these things, it gives you encouragement for the practice. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha also prefaced meditation practice with practice in generosity, practice in the precepts. Because as you follow the Buddha's teachings in ways that are simpler and easier to follow and see the results that come, it gives you confidence in the teaching that even though some of the instructions may seem counterintuitive, they work. So when you come to the practice fortified, by these practices and fortified by your understanding of where this teaching came from. That can help get you over the, the dry periods when all you seem to be doing is dragging your mind back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But that sense of confidence has to be augmented also by your willingness to be observant. There's a book on learning how to swim. It talks about how to practice swimming. And the principles apply to any kind of skill. That when you're practicing, you don't just go through the motions or put in the time. You have to observe. What's the most efficient way of getting through the water? How do you hold your head? How do you watch your stroke to see how you can make your stroke more efficient? So you can use less energy and at the same time go faster, go longer. It's the same way with working on those scales. What's the most efficient way of getting the notes out of the piano? So that what in the beginning is a very effortful process really does become effortless as you streamline your understanding of what you're doing. It's the same with meditation. You find that you have to Learn how to streamline your understanding of what it means to keep the mind focused. You start out by basically doing too much. You tense up the body, and you engage all kinds of other parts of the mind to try to keep the mind there, and yet that you can't maintain that amount of tension, so the mind is sure to slip off. And then you try to have no effort at all, of course it's going to slip off again. What you've got to do is notice. Okay, where is the excess energy that's being expended on this that's making it more difficult than it has to be? What's the most efficient way of staying with the breath? What's the most efficient place to focus, the most efficient way of understanding the breath that helps you stay there? So that the amount of effort that you put into each moment of meditation is totally possible, totally sustainable. And you do develop a sense of ease with being with the breath. So you've got to be observant. It's in this way that directed thought and evaluation do eventually lead to a sense of ease, even a sense of rapture, when the mind can really settle down. Because it's not just a matter of forcing, but it's a matter of understanding what you're doing. And looking at through that lens of where is the unnecessary stress, where is the unnecessary amount of effort that's being expended? When is the effort too much? When is it too little? When is it just right? This is why only so much of the meditation can be taught in terms of words saying, do this, do that, the technique they tell you to do. And a lot of it has to come from your own input, your own willingness to observe, to learn from your mistakes. The process is not necessarily pleasant, but it's the only way to learn. And it has the advantage that it develops your powers of perception, your powers of discernment while you do it. So just as when you learn how to play the scales well, you're learning a lot of the other skills you're going to need to play music well. When you learn how to keep the mind with one object, in spite of all those other temptations to create worlds that you want to inhabit, you're learning the precise skills that are needed to get the mind to settle down. The 
is what's meant by that saying that the, the path and the goal are not different. In other words, in doing the path well, you find right there in the doing of the path that the goal starts to appear. So don't just put in the time, saying, well, I hope I get past this time and then the results will come on their own. You've got to watch. You've got to observe. You've got to be willing to learn. If it mean, even if it means going back and relearning the steps that you think that only beginners have to do. Everybody has to learn these things. And the more attention you pay to them, the more lessons you learn.